Most positive. All right. Um, so to get right into it, here we go. Um, so our first case is a two-year-old neutered male golden retriever poodle mix, golden doodle. Um, this is uh, this dog's left eye. Um, we also previously received this dog's right eye. Um, so this is uh, ultimately a bilateral enucleation. Um, so I'm going to start with the initial eye because we'll sort of tell this story um, from the start. Excuse the scraping that may have uh, sounded in the microscope or microphone. All right. We're going to tell the story from the beginning. Um, so we should probably start with the, the gross description, though. Um, there's retinal detachment in this eye. Um, and that's kind of about it. So the histology is the most uh, interesting bit. Let's look at this full screen. There we go. Okay. So this is not the eye you just saw the gross of. This is the other eye, the right eye. Um, and I'm showing this to you first because it's the one that we got first. Um, and it is relatively more severe. Um, so there is uh, some syneciation up front. There's some pan uveitis. You can see that the uveal tract here is a little bit too purple. Um, but most of what's going on is in the posterior segment. We do have a retinal detachment in this case. We have a retinal tear, which we'll look at closer in a moment. And we have a lot of inflammation inside the vitreal chamber and the subretinal space. So let's drop right in. Make sure. Let me also make sure that we're in focus on the screen here. Yeah, okay. So uh, we can tell that this retina is truly torn um, because the end of the tear is sort of rounded on itself. Um, artifactual tears will tend to be very sharply uh, delineated, sort of like a boxy square end. Um, the retina that we're looking at here is pretty severely inflamed. Uh, for example, this is a pretty big perivascular cluster of lymphocytes right here where the arrow is. Um, and there's more generalized inflammation in the retina as well. Um, the exudate inside the uh, ocular chambers is mostly macrophages and neutrophils. So we've got that. And you can see that a similar um, suppurative and macrophage-based inflammation is sort of carpeting the uh, uveal tract. And the inflammation in the uveal stroma itself is lymphoplasmacytic. Um, so a pretty severely inflamed eye. And despite the fact that we have this giant blue dot here, I'm going to ignore that and go straight to the GMS because it'll be much more pretty to look at. So we did some special stains on this case looking for microorganisms. And we will pay attention to the pretty blue dot in this slide, which is a GMS. And pretty much only in this one spot, we found some fungal organisms. Um, so the GMS is a silver-based stain. The black uh, stain of these organisms is a positive result. Um, and the morphology of these organisms is a little bit weird. Um, they actually look like they might be doing some narrow-based budding, maybe some pseudo hyphal type structures. Um, there were some other uh, organisms in this slide that looked a little bit more boxy or hyphae-like. So um, we did a little bit of equivocating and kind of landed on maybe it's a true hyph uh, hyphal organism with non-parallel walls and septations. Um, but here it does kind of look like budding, right? Um, long story short, uh, it was a sort of unusual morphology and very low numbers of fungus inside this uh, very inflamed eye of a young dog. Um, and usually we suspect that um, something like this is going to be an ocular manifestation of systemic disease, so a systemic mycosis, um, particularly because this eye also didn't have any evidence of trauma, um, so like a traumatic inoculation into the eye. Um, so... That said, uh, sort of a, it's sort of a summary, but uh, this patient didn't have any um, systemic signs of illness. Um, this dog has had a full systemic workup and nothing else has been found outside of this eye. And then the other eye, which also developed uveitis. Um, and despite uh, attempts to medically manage it, the eye ultimately ended up enucleated. And that's how we got to um, the eye that we currently had, um, the one that you saw the gross of with the retinal attachment. 
Um, and this eye, the inflammation inside it was much less severe to the extent that we had to take many deeper sections just to capture a good area, but it is here. So just a brief tour around this eye, um, much more quiet than the last one that we saw. The lens is a little bit of a weird shape, which may be sort of artifact. Um, there is the retinal detachment, though, with a little bit of retina schesis, these spaces between the nuclear layers, and again, a tear of the retina with that curled up end. And then the inflammation, which is a lot less severe, but when we look at it closer, it's a similar character, macrophages and neutrophils. And in this case, also quite a lot of necrotic debris. You can see almost kind of epithelioid macrophages here and necrotic debris, eosinophilic cellular and karyorectic. Um, and there's also these kind of like poorly staining gaps, maybe if you put on your imaginoscope in this necrotic debris. And of course, we also put a GMS for fungus on this one. So same area from before with a GMS this time. And here are these organisms again. So again, the, the, there were much more organisms in this one, so I wanted to spend a little bit more time showing you this slide. So here's some of those sort of more straight segment looking pieces of the fungus in the corner here. Um, and then here's more of these that look more like narrow based budding or pseudo hyphal type structures. So it's kind of a weird morphology for an intraocular fungus. Um, you know, we don't often see ones that look exactly like this. It's very difficult for us to speciate. It's in essence impossible for us to speciate just on morphology alone. Um, we did do a panfungal PCR on the first eye, the one that you saw before this one, um, and it came up with a Malassezia species, which we assume is uh, basically a spurious result, um, like an amplification of an environmental contaminant. Um, Malassezia, as far as I had been able to find, has not really been described causing intraocular infections, although there have been rare reports of candida-related uh, ocular infections. Um, and again, we assume that this dog uh, was ha um, having systemic mycosis and that these both eyes were involved as part of an ocular manifestation of systemic disease. Um, but the dog continues to have no evidence of systemic illness. So um, this was kind of an all around strange case. Um, definitely uh, actually curious if anyone listening has any ideas about the um, fungal morphology in this case, um, what they think about these fungal organisms. Um, and uh, that's this one. It, it was a very unusual case, unusual presentation. Um, yeah. And so there's the diagnosis. Um, and uh, that's all. Um, are there any questions or comments about this case? Okay, moving right along. Oh, there's Jack. No, that oh. was me. Oh, okay, that was okay, cool. Uh, there we go. All right, so the next case is another dog. Um, we have a... 12-year-old male golden retriever poodle mix. I didn't do that on purpose. Another golden doodle. Um, so this dog has a history of previous ocular trauma, which will be important in a moment. Um, they describe a severe uveitis, conjunctivitis, scleritis, buthalmus, secondary glaucoma. Um, and then at the end, they mention that there is expected intraocular mass. Um, hopefully you guys can't hear that buzzing. There's some construction going on, um, if you can. Uh, so suspected intraocular mass and a history of trauma in the eye of a dog. Okay. So um, this eye is pretty interesting. So just to orient you, we've got our cornea here. And what we started on and that walked right across is at the edge of the cornea, kind of right at the limbus or so, um, we have a full thickness discontinuity in this globe um, with a little bit of uveal prolapse. There's basically nothing here in terms of sclera. Um, so there's a little focal rupture of this globe here, or actually kind of a large focal rupture. Um, but we're going to continue to walk around this globe. And what you see is that it's basically full of necrotic debris. The uvea is pretty effaced. There's lots of hemorrhage. 
You can barely make out where retina may have been. It's questionable. So lots of chronic hemorrhage, lots of necrotic debris, a pretty severe cataract as well. And when you look at the necrosis closer, you can see that there's a lot of areas of sort of coagulative necrosis where you can still make out outlines of cells. And this kind of gives the impression that it was a solid tissue that, become, that became extensively necrotic. So definitely we're concerned about intraocular mass. And it takes a lot of looking, especially in this extra slice, to find anything viable. And here we do have some viable cells at the very edge of this necrotic mass. They're polygonal. They maybe sometimes maybe you put your magnetoscope on, but maybe for real have this sort of uh, anastomosing cord architecture. Um, and they're clearly neoplastic. So this is a form of a carcinoma, but if you're not convinced yet, we're going to switch to this slide. Again, another view of that nice little rupture in the globe, um, consistent with the trauma that they described earlier. But what I mostly want to show you is over here. Oops. Um, and so we have these similar cells, again, um, viable pretty much just on the border of the necrotic mass. And then in this case, these cells are also extending into the lumens of vessels in the sclera. So this is vascular invasion of this tumor. And they're showing much more their anastomosis and cord architecture in this area as well, just sort of confirming that this is indeed a carcinoma. Um, so with this case, uh, one of our top differentials is going to be what Koplau refers to as pleomorphic iridociliary carcinoma. Um, so basically, when you diagnose iridociliary tumors in the eye, um, the iridociliary adenoma is probably the most common. It can be uveoinvasive or non-uveoinvasive. And it's a benign tumor for which uh, complete excision is typically curative. We also will diagnose reticillary carcinomas, um, which are basically just delineated by their invasive behavior. So if they start to invade into the sclera is where we tend to make our cutoff. Um, we'll call it a carcinoma just because theoretically it's showing more you know, invasive behavior, maybe more malignant uh, behavior. However, even when we diagnose that sort of scleral invasion, um, iridocillary carcinomas also tend to behave fairly uh, benign in terms of a biological sense, um, where complete excision can be curative. Uh, so pleomorphic iridocillary adenocarcinoma is something that we distinguish as a primary tumor to the eye uh, developing in the iridocillary epithelium that is a truly malignant tumor um, with a potential for metastasis. Um, so uh, that's one of our differentials for a case like this. Um, potentially, you could include um, metastatic carcinoma to the eye, but given that this tumor is filling the eye and distorting the local tissue, it seems more likely that this is a primary tumor developing in the ocular tissue. Um, the other thing to note is that with this dog's history of a previous trauma, which is corroborated histologically by these sites of globe rupture, um, the iridociliary adenocarcinomas, uh, the truly malignant ones, uh, the pleomorphic iridociliary adenocarcinomas, um, uh, sometimes will have a history of trauma for whatever reason. And sometimes also some of them will have a history of gentamicin injection um, into the eye. Um, so just something interesting that we're kind of keeping track of. Um, and this one kind of follows that pattern. So that is this case. And here are the diagnoses. Uh, that's it. Any questions or comments on that one? Okay, I will scoot a boot. Uh, did we do a PAS on that one? Oh, did we do a PAS on that one? We did not. We probably should have, though. It would have been cool. So when we do PAS stains uh, for our reticillary tumors, um, oftentimes the reticillary tumors from adenomas, carcinomas, and this pleomorphic version um, will produce these very thick basement membranes, um, which will um, often really only be highlighted very well on the PAS stain. Um, the PAS stain will also sometimes highlight those basement membranes uh, in the areas of necrosis, um, which uh, they sort of will sort of been left behind by uh, the cells after they become necrotic. And finding those thick basement membranes uh, is usually a bit of uh, additional corroborative evidence that this is indeed a primary ocular tumor. So we'll often do that, but not in this case. So, um, all right, any other questions or comments? Okay, next case. I wondered about that. Um, you, did I get, did you not do that? Yeah. 
Readouts. Readouts. What's oh, that? Okay, never mind, never mind. It's probably, it's probably me downstairs. I can go. No, he can do it here. Oh. Or he just needs to give permission here. If you. Person. Um, one way to do it is this. So now they can, but yeah. now everybody can unmute themselves. So. Yes, now we can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There was a question in the chat about whether there was a PAS performed on the carcinoma case. Ah, we, we just answered that question. Yeah, that's why I was trying to unmute. Oh, okay, got it. Thanks. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, so this next case uh, that we have, uh, we don't have any gross photos. So uh, Megan was kind enough to grace you with a cute photo of a puppy. Um, from this uh, two-year-old male German Shepherd dog um, that we received um, the conjunctiva from the left eye. Uh, the dog had a history of mild anterior uveitis and chor chorioretinitis in both eyes diagnosed um, at the RDVM uh, to which they did extensive workup and apparently hadn't found a cause. Um, they did note that the left uh, eye had a white to tan lobulated temporal perilimbal conjunctival swelling um, that they wanted to rule out a parasitic or inflammatory uh, reaction there. Uh, they did note that aspergillosis testing, which is common in German Shepherd dogs, um, was missing from their extensive workup. So they were um, on a hunt for those as well. Um, so we got a sample of the left conjunctiva. <laughs> This on. All right. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a, a, uh -huh, there we go. Okay. Excellent. All right. So we have a couple sections, a uh, bisected section here of conjunctiva. Um, from the left eye of the German Shepherd dog. Um, we can see that the substantia propria is markedly expanded. Um, and there's a lot of clear space in here, which was interesting from low power. And as we get closer, what we notice is that there are a lot of macrophages in here, um, but there's also these lovely yeast organisms. And so these guys, You see these lovely um, about four to eight micron diameter yeasts in the center here, surrounded by this large, uh, maybe up to 10 microns in diameter clear space. It kind of gives it a lovely soap bubble appearance using some classic word and terminology here. Um, and so these are more consistent with Cryptococcus species. Uh, we did not see any evidence of fungal hyphae that would suggest aspergillosis. And we did do some special stains uh, more for educational and fun purposes. Um, our first one, kind of a classic, um, is a Musi Carmine. Stain, which highlights the yeast capsule, a lovely pink red color. And if pink red is not your uh, <laughs> color of choice, we also did an Alcyon Blue PIS. Which will highlight the capsule in a more blue color. So this was really, really pretty, um, a little um, different than kind of leaning towards the aspergillosis based on the history. Um, but I believe they did do um, fungal testing and urine antigen did come up with cryptococcus. Um, so- um, Yeah, by the time we 
we were ready to write the report. We got feedback from the, the veterinarians that they had and some a little bit more work on this dog. And then on urine, they had uh, urine testing, which they were not specific about what they did, but they um, had a suspicion for cryptococcus then uh, and a systemic disease. Yeah, so fun to see those guys. Any questions or comments for that case? Oh, that's right. I gotta do this. Okay. And so, yeah, again, marked granulomatous conjunctivitis um, with myriad intralesional yeasts that were consistent with cryptococcus. It was an interesting presentation, the fact that it presented as a subconjunctival mass. Um, I've um, talk to the clinicians that submitted this case and the dog didn't have obvious intraocular lesions at the point at, at, at that time they but they thought there were there was kind of mild flare and mild signs of intraocular inflammation but nothing um super impressive so um yeah just to show a different presentation of a systemic disease All right, so next up, uh, we have the left eye from a Labrador dog. Uh, they did not give us the age or sex of the animal. Um, this dog presented with acute onset of pain in the left eye uh, five days prior to presentation. Severely, exclamation point, painful, exclamation point, in all caps. Mm -hmm. So um, the eye was non-visual, um, had an increased igula intraocular pressure at uh, 40, um, severe chemosis, um, kind of firm um, bulbar conjunctiva all around uh, the eye, um, and some orbital cellulitis. Um, they also noted um, complete retinal detachment and uh, kind of a posterior mass effect on ultrasound. So they gave us the left eye, um, which in this gross photo here, uh, you can see there is some kind of thickness to the um, tissues kind of around uh, the outside of the eye. Um, Nuvia looks kind of okay, but there is this uh, white opaque material, probably um, exudate here um, in the vitreous and some cloudiness uh, to the vitreous as well. Okay, here. Press F11 also. Yeah, that's right. There we go. All right. Let's see. Um, so here's kind of a subgross um, of the eye. Uh, the lens is artifactually out here. Um, as you saw in the picture, it was in place. Um, we have a little kind of artifact defect in the cornea um, from processing and stuff. But in the back of the eye, um, there's a lot of. Um, Exudate and cellular infiltrate here. It's lifting off the retina, which is detached. Um, and again, a lot of thickness um, to sort of the episcleral tissue. Okay. All right. Most of the fun stuff was in the back of the eye. Um, so again, the retina here is lifted off and underneath it in the subretinal space here, uh, there is abundant uh, neutrophils and macrophages in the cellular infiltrate. And also uh, goes into the retina. And I'm trying to make my way over to my lovely blue dot here because also mixed in with this infiltrate. Well, you guys can start seeing these. Um, again, are these large yeast organisms? And it's a good one that occasionally exhibit this broad-based budding uh, here. Um, some of these are also highlighted with these kind of radiating um, spicules of material. Oh, that's right, I can't go one higher. People at home. People at home. 
<laughs> um, Um, and so the radiating material kind of surrounding these yeast organisms is known as splendory hopley material. Um, kind of helps highlight the yeast in all of this background of intense inflammation. Um, so there was uh, maybe a little bit more mild inflammation in the front of the eye, in the iris leaflets, in the ciliary body. Um, but a lot of the thickening to the tissues around in the episclera uh, was, again, uh, a lot of edema uh, and a lot of inflammation. Neutrophils, macrophages, um, yeast organisms were, were outside here. Oh, and I didn't intend to fall on this one, but this is a nice one within a blood vessel. So they were really within the blood vessels as well. Um, so we did warn them to maybe look for systemic disease, um, since blastomycosis is also often a systemic disease as well. We generally assume it's systemic when yeah. it gets to the eye, generally speaking. Yep. And uh, we did also get some orbital tissues since they mentioned orbital cellulitis um, and they looked pretty much similar with inflammation. Um, and uh, their main concern was to rule out neoplasia. So we did do that um, and told them that it was infectious instead. So we had severe pyogranulomatous and lymphoplasmacytic uh, panophthalmitis um, with uh, intralesional yeast that were consistent with the blastomyces dermatitis. And looks like this dog was in from Maine. Hmm. No, Massachusetts. Massachusetts, MA. So yeah, it's a little yeah. interesting location. Dance, perhaps. <laughs> global warming. Global warming. I don't know. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Switching up here. Okay. So if you are wondering, this is not an eye. Uh, right, this is a um, third island mass from an 11 year, five month old female spay great Pyrenees dog. They describe a fur mass arising from the posterior surface of the third island. And as you can see here, make it a little bigger. Yep, indeed. We have, um, it's, it's even, it's really hard to identify most of the anatomical structures, but you can see the third eyelid cartilage here on top. You might, we might, I don't know, assume that this is the uh, leading edge of the third eyelid, but there's a, a conjunctival uh, surface covering around and this large mass with a, with an out pouching here, kind of a, you know, We've been talking about buddy. It looks like another <laughs> mass budding out of a larger nice. mass. Uh, and there's this tan white to in areas very darkly pigmented uh, hue to it. Let's go back to the the ones calling the lab. Clearly not or really want us to know something about the, the round or it's not participating in rounds, shame on you. Okay, let me get, got multiple sections. Let me get a central section here. I will, I'll probably do a lower magnification here. So just to confirm our impressions. So this is a low mag, try to go on lower. Even it might not be that helpful. I don't think the camera likes it. Oh, there you go. Just to confirm, um, that was indeed the leading edge of the third eyelid, and there's a little bit of a of the cartilage and the mass. So kind of relatively well delineated mass. So jumping right on it. Okay. 
Um, first thing, let's look for any anatomical borders or any identifiable landmarks. Again, the tip of the third eyelid right there. You can see the conjunctival epithelium on both ends. Um, based kind of on the the curvature here, you would assume that this is the you know palpebral side and the bulbar side of the conjunctival, but that can get a little distorted when you have a large mass like that. So take that with a grain of salt. That's what I'm trying to say. Here are the deeper margins. You can see a layer, kind of a facial layer of muscle there in the deeper portions of it. Uh, here is the deeper like orbital aspect of this mass. We come around, there's more conjunctiva, uh, some remnants of the third island gland, which have been compressed and uh, almost effaced by the whole mass and a markedly hyperplastic conjunctiva epithelium. Now, we get a little closer to the mass itself. It's a very homogeneous population of cells. Uh, there are some inflammatory cells here in there, but we're going to ignore that. At this point, you can see that it's mostly kind of polygonal to fusiform population of cells, and it's uh, sprinkled with some more basophilic dead dots, which are mostly mitotic figures. So you go count it right now. Uh, there's a ton. And yep, in this field, I think... Um, Fair to say we have more than 20. Uh, so we're dealing with something malignant, right? So these are um, fusiform to polygonal cells. Sometimes they form uh, this poorly uh, distinct uh, uh, stream. Sometimes it's more sheet-like. There are a few. It could be multinucleated cells or just uh, tightly packed neoplastic cells. And if you look around, um, we shouldn't forget the fact that grossly the mass looked pretty dark, right? And again, I will ask you to turn your imaginoscope on at this time. If you look around, you might see, and I don't know how well that shows on uh, on your uh, screens over there, but there is a dusting of a brown pigment in the cytoplasm of a bunch of these cells. Right. This is something we look for um, in the diagnosis, uh, well, in general, and more specifically in this case, um, based on the color of the mass and, uh, and gross appearance, a, a malignant melanoma was on the differential, or a mel melanocytic tumor, I should say. And if you look around, you see something like that here and there. So that's a, a good uh, indication that these cells are very likely of melanocytic origin. Another thing that we like to do, we look around. Uh, for some reason, uh, a lot of these tumors, uh, ocular surface melanomas, but other types of melanocytic tumors, if you go to the periphery, if you go towards the epithelium, the neoplasm tends to be more well differentiated and there's a higher likelihood of identifying more obviously pigmented cells. And also melanocytic cells are they can be epithelotropic. So this is a tough one because there is this very severe lymphoplasmocytic infiltration associated with the whole thing. Uh, so identifying your plastic cells infiltrating there might be hard. Um, good thing is that we have a bunch of sections. So let's look at that um, area that we saw grossly, that a budding tumor coming off of the main mass. It looked pretty then black grossly. Let's see again. Oh, here we go. Tip of the third eyelid. Now we have a cartilage. So help in the identification of this as a third eyelid tissue. And where is it? Let's see. There we go. So another cool feature is that, or something that they hi this highlights is the fact that you don't need a lot of melanin to make something very, very black grossly, right? You can see here, there's not a lot of, you know, I, I would have expected much more obvious melanin pigmentation based on how it looked grossly, but 
you can definitely see it, but not as a, you know, diffusely pigmented or diffusely black as you would expect. But here, um, this really helps, right? It's, it's nice when they're wearing name tags. Now we do have obviously neoplastic cells or ne ne neoplastic cells that are obviously pigmented. Um, Got to be careful with that sometimes, especially when the native uh, tissue is pigmented to begin with. This could be just necrosis or pigmentation, you know, a, a melanin release from necrotic tissue. But we're, we don't necessarily expect to have a lot of melanin pigmentation in the third eyelid uh, stroma or substantia propria in this case, or gland. So this here is a, an excellent uh, area for the diagnosis. Another caveat about these melanocytic tumors, um, don't sweat it out too much if you're in an area that you uh, don't really um, see uh, uh, pigmentation or it's not well differentiated. It's go somewhere else, go take a look in other areas. You might find an easier um, location to make the diagnosis, kind of like that, right? So not only we have that coarse, dark melanin pigmentation, but also in the background, that more uh, fine brown, amber looking pigment that I was talking about. Um, let's check the surface here because that's, uh, well, to have extensive areas of necrosis um, does not necessarily impact the diagnosis or the prognosis, but it is a feature in this case. But it's interesting that this tumor decided that it was going to be more yeah. on the substantia propria itself, maybe affecting the gland. And uh, it's not really going into the epithelium that much, uh, at least as far as we, we've we seen it. Uh, and I don't remember. So yeah, in areas like that, it becomes really hard because of the inflammation. So our diagnosis was a um, malignant melanoma or a conjunctival malignant melanoma affecting mostly the third eyelid. The margins were uh, affected, especially the deep margins. Uh, and the, the, the main problem with these guys is the... Um, they tend to recur because the uh, they have a tendency to do a pagetoid spread, which means they will, well, we said complete excision, I guess. And yeah, you're right, complete excision here. And um, because they tend to infiltrate the epithelium and um, the epithelium away from the main mass in the conjunctiva. So very often you excise a conjunctival mass and then... Um, the tumor will recur kind of away from the main mass because of that epithelial spread. So every time you're looking for margins on these guys, you're not only looking for the, the deep margins, but also the adjacent epithelium. Um, and we often suggest that if uh, there's recurrence of the tumor, um, of this conjunctival malignant melanoma, is that uh, exenteration of the ocular tissues is the best um, uh, way to go to prevent further spread. They, they tend not to metastasize. I don't think we have many, if any, that I remember that have metastasis. We, there, yeah. They can metastasize. Yeah. We found that, I don't know, we don't have a good percentage, but I think we need to back off that and mm -hmm. say that they can metastasize. Yeah, we're, we're, working we're, on a, we're, we're working on a project right now where we're looking yeah. at those. And um, yeah, so they can metastasize. Let's put it that way. Okay, next case. is this filler right here, 30. There you go, 29, 20, 29, 21. is an 11-year-old domestic short-haired cat. Um, they describe both thalamus uh, blind with a historically elevated intraocular pressure uh, and it was normal tensive during the day of surgery. Take that with a grain of salt based on the image there. Um, first presented to a uh, diplomat of the uh, American College of Veterinary Ophthalmology in back in 2009. And then as cats do or cat owners do, uh, I don't know what the situation is. It disappeared for all these um, four years and they came back with the history of being blind 
and with the history of uveitis. Uh, and over the last six months with a progressive hypopion hyphema, possible soft tissue infiltration in the interior chamber. And they were concerned for an intraocular neoplasm. Do you think it's a valid concern? Just to add to the problem, um, the cat has chronic diabetes, not treated, it's FIV positive, has a megacolon, has a, uh, a <laughs> acromegaly phenotype, toxoplasma, and Bartonella positive. So poor thing. And yep. And out came the eye. So here it is. Um, we have, um, you can see the lens right there in the middle. That's the most charitable thing we can say about this eye. There is a lens. Here's the cornea. And circumferentially sort of infiltrated in this eye, there's this white tissue. It could be an exudate. It could be a mass. They were even uh, um, debating that. Another thing that we can see is an obviously detached retina right here, detached, folded, very likely torn. So some of that exudate is supracoroidal slash subretinal. Some of it is attached to the to the retina. Uh, some of it is carpeting the ciliary body. I you again, you know, squint very hard, and you might see the the iris right here. And there's more of that exudative cell infiltrate in the pupillary space into your chamber, admixed with hemorrhage. You can see some of the iris leaflet profile here on the other side. So let's jump right in. Oh, let me get that out of there. And with melanomas. Here is the subgross. Okay. See if I'm able to do something here to make it. Uh, no, it does. Okay, so just so we can take a look, so gross is not the best focus uh, that we can, but just uh, to give an idea of distribution, optic nerve here in the back, as optic nerve should be in the back. We got the cornea and the lens, and uh, this hyper basophilia circumferentially affecting the eye. We're going to dissect it a little bit better, but just so you guys have a sense of the distribution of everything. So just hyper basophilia, meaning there are cells there. We don't know what they are yet. That's why we're getting there now. Okay. So here is front of the eye. Let me clean this up a little bit. All right, here it is. So cornea, there's some neovascularization of the cornea, um, as you can see, and some cell infiltrate in the deep corneal stroma. There is keratinization and mild hyperplasia of the corneal epithelium, not uh, surprising based on how much um, probably exposure there was. If you look around, um, you can see this mixture of both cells and vessels, right? Uh, every where you have red blood cells that did dots, those are vessels. Uh, and there are some infiltrating cells. These infiltrating cells, they look small, they look lymphocytic. There are some neutrophils here and there, but um, we'll uh, reserve judgment for now. Let's put it that way. There are some obvious plasma cells here and there. Maybe a neosinophil coming in, just like lost and like trying to make some friends. But uh, yeah, not much we can tell here uh, about this infiltrate in the cornea. There is some hydropic degeneration of the corneal epithelium suggesting that there was corneal edema. Um, sometimes that's the easiest way to identify corneal edema in such affected corneas. And uh, the cornea grossly kind of look a little more opaque. But stop beating around the bush here and focus on the main thing. So uh, it's hard to identify the uveal tissue. One of the easiest ways to go about that when you are endowed or there's almost effacement of the uvea, kind of like in this case, is 
find the pigment, right? So there's melanin here. If you trace the melanin around, you can see it forms a line uh, that's in the, you know, facing the internal aspects of the eye. So probably that's the posterior aspect of the iris, the iris um, or the re re remaining iris pigmented epithelium. And we got the, we're moving towards what is probably the ciliary body surface with some ciliary body uh, pigmented epithelium there. Uh, again, uh, a little bit more of that. It's uh, it's definitely effaced, but those things just help you um, get a better sense of where you are. Of course, fo uh, following that, you have the choroid. The choroid is actually still identifiable somewhat. So that's helpful, but on top of it, we have that infiltrate and you can see that there's a the the infiltrate is uh cellular in areas or the basophilic areas and extremely eosinophilic in some other areas suggesting extensive areas of necrosis not only that every time you see viable cells you can probably see a vessel in the center which suggests a pattern of survival around blood vessels that in turn suggests that this was a um uh, tissue, let's put it that way for now. We're not gonna, well, it's, it is a tumor, right? but it is a, a neoplastic proliferation that probably outgrew its vascular supply. And what you end up with is cells that are surviving closer to the source of um, that vascular supply and cells dying uh, as they go far away from that. So extensive areas of necrosis. And just to show you guys the, the distribution of your it's on the surface of the choroid, extending into the subretinal space. And again, yeah, it looks like this should have been retina, right? And the reason I'm saying that is because the location is in front of the choroid, free floating around. And if you trace a line, here's the optic nerve. It extends from the shoulder of the optic nerve. There are some vessels in there. So that's very likely the retina. But it was the retina, to be honest, because now it is a um, infiltrated and effaced by the same cells. And when I say that, you can both see the neoplastic cells that are still relatively viable. And on the areas of necrosis, you have, you know, just the ghosts of necrotic neoplastic cells. So those are not even uh, retinal cells anymore or the neurons, right? So again, looking at the morphology of these guys, they are pleomorphic, but they're cells of a type. They have multiple cells that are um, individualized, so very likely a round cell tumor. You can um, apply Dr. De Bilzig's um, twe uh, tweezers test very scientific test developed here at Koplau where you use your imagination and you grab a, a uh, you know, your um, imagined teeny tiny tweezer and you're able to grab one cell, pull that cell away from the other ones without bringing the other ones together. You're probably dealing with a discrete cell tumor or a round cell tumor. So a lot of these guys will probably come off without touching the other ones. So uh, likely a round cell tumor. Size-wise, um, they have kind of round to polygonal nuclei, not a lot of cytoplasm compared to the size of their nucleus. Very large nucleoli, pleomorphic nucleolus, uh, or uh, pleomorphic nuclei, mitotic figures in there. Got some weird looking mitten shape. Was that Wisconsin or Michigan? That's... That's Wisconsin, unless it's uh, the other way around where you guys are seeing it. Um, so it is uh, a round cell tumor, very pleomorphic round cell tumor based on the distribution, the size and the morphology of the cells. It looks like lymphoma. And um, this has the pattern of what we call a post-traumatic lymphoma. Uh, the reason I say that is the distribution of the cell, so the, the, the circumferential effacement of the eye, uh, the presence of extensive areas of necrosis with survival rumble of vessels, the effacement of 
the the retina and, and necrosis of the retina. These are all features of what we call a post-traumatic lymphoma, but it's a lymphoma that's slightly associated with chronic uh, ocular disease uh, with or without trauma. Um, the reason we use the nomenclature post-traumatic is because the, the the distribution of the cells, it's uh, reminiscent of the post-traumatic sarcomas in cats, uh, um, the, the ocular post-traumatic sarcomas. Um, and the, the reason it is important is that we believe that this pattern suggests a primary ocular lymphoma, meaning a lymphoma that started in the eye, kind of like a chronic lymphoma associated with uh, um, intestinal disease in cats or chronic uh, IBD in cats. Um, it doesn't mean that this cannot become systemic, of course, right? It's a lymphoma. These cells are, are programmed to go places and, and, and to uh, 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 circulate. So... Um, we don't know how often that happens, but there is a possibility that a lymphoma like this, a primary ocular lymphoma, will become systemic. But it's uh, when 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 we have a pattern like this, it's unlikely that it started as a systemic lymphoma. Um, things that we look for because we think it's a primary lymphoma, uh, defining margins becomes a little bit more important uh, than uh, when when you have, of course, a systemic lymphoma. So we look at the optic nerves. We look at any infiltration in the sclera or beyond the sclera in the episclera or in the orbit. Uh, we don't have a lot of the optic nerve here, but what we have seems to be clean of neoplastic cells. Uh, so the margins appear to be clear, but that doesn't mean this will not become systemic. We um, often offer immunos or immunohistochemistry to confirm. Um, there was a... Uh, idea that these were more B uh, lymphomas than T cell lymphomas, but I think we might be changing that um, that idea. They can actually be anything. Um, they can be T cell, B cells. They can be all sorts of uh, phenotype of lymphoma. Uh, anaplastic lymphoma sometimes are very, very ugly. Um, and it kind of goes along with, well, the chronic history, right? There's a there. There's a long-standing history of ocular disease here. Not only ocular, but uh, systemic disease, but uh, specifically ocular disease in this case. So, um, fits that idea of a chronic, um, long-standing ocular disease uh, that very likely um, started as a chronic lymphoplasmocytic uveitis that transformed into a lymphoma. Any questions you guys have there? I see some questions in the, or something's popping up in the chat, but I guess Stephen is on, is on it. Um, no, not yet. Okay. So let me see here. We have a few minutes. Let's see a bunch of coronavirus. Uh, okay. Yeah, junction activity, vegetoid spread. Okay. All right. Well, that's what we have for today. I'm going to end up uh, with a few minutes ahead of schedule. Thanks for um, joining us, and we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Now let's let this computer handle.